Good evening and welcome to another You in the Word. I'm Chaplain Kevin Santucci and thank you for joining us this evening for another edition of an open Bible discussion. These open Bible discussions are prepared with you in mind that we can come together to best be able to help one another as we discuss the Word of God. If you have any questions, any concerns, or maybe a statement that you would like to uh, put forth to me and to those who are listening in or maybe watching, please do so. I encourage your, your participation and I think it's healthy that we should be able to dialogue one with another. With that said, friends, we invite you to turn your hearts with me unto God as we seek His face for another evening open Bible discussion. Father, we come before Thy presence this evening in the name of Jesus. We are thankful for You keeping us and protecting us since the last time which we have been here. Now we ought to go before us. Bless Thy people with me as we uh, endeavor to share this evening's message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our message this evening is part two of a message which I shared with you last week. There are some who are tuning in with us for the first time, and we do thank you very much for tuning in with us for the first time. But to those who have been here with us uh, for some time, we say thank you very much for continually uh, joining in with us here on You and the Word. Our message this, this evening is entitled, Listen to the Voice of the Teacher, Part 2. I want to thank you, first of all, for those who have made comments last week uh, on our discussion. There were some who made some strong comments, and there were others, friends, who made general comments. But I want to say to all of you who made any form of comments, thank you very much. There are some who have stated that they are truly enjoying these open Bible discussions uh, every Friday evening. And we come to you every Friday evening at the same time with this live broadcast of sharing with you uh, the Word of God. And so we're getting directly or going directly into the Word of God this evening. And I'd like to just recapitulate last week on a few points which we had talked about. Last week, if you were here, uh, we learned that Jesus was a teacher whose teaching was unique. Now, friends, the Bible says that the people were astonished at his doctrine or his manner of teaching. And that means that there's some, there was something special about the teaching of Jesus Christ, friends, that caught the attention of everybody. Would it be that when preachers or teachers preach, that they preach not just to a certain classification of people or a certain group or neither uh, a certain ethnic group, may I be more specific here, or maybe your homeboys, but they are able to reach everyone. This was the ministry of Jesus Christ. It was His desire to reach and meet the hearts of everyone. Jesus taught in such a way that people felt so comfortable with his teaching. We also learned last week that Jesus was a teacher who was not appreciated by his immediate family and community. Now friends, this comes with many problems because some would tend to think that in the areas which you are brought up in or maybe the church that you have grown up in, the community you've grown up in, People would, yes, dearly love you, particularly if you've gone overseas, done further studies, you've come back home or may have been on some various on various missionary journeys. People should at least appreciate these sort of people. But friends, this is further from the truth. The truth be told, friends, that many people really envy or show form of form, some form of jealousy or disgust to people who are trying their best to help other people. Now, some would ask the question, why? Well, the biggest question in the question is this here, why not? If Satan hate, hated Jesus' friends, definitely he would hate his followers. I like it the way how those in Hawaii put it, that those who are Christians are considered as Jesus boys and, gir Jesus boys and Jesus girls. And if you be Jesus boy or a Jesus girl that is following the dictates or the will of God, friends, then you're going to be hated. 
The word of God reminds us in John, Think it not strange concerning the fiery darts which are to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. You see, friends, we're going to all go through some form of challenge. But the greatest challenge comes not just from the community or from your family, your immediate area, or your organization, but when it comes directly from the congregation that you actually grew up in. Wow. That is really a big one there, friends. And when we consider the way how people tend to treat one another uh, in various congregations, you wonder, is this here the Church of the Living God, or is it just some organization or structure, you know, where people come and go, or when you promote or demote various people? You know, friends, we need to get it together. And as one said, friends, we need to learn the lesson of the children. They're found in Mark chapter chapter 10 and verse 16. Jesus said that unless we become like little children, we will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we need to learn the lessons of which Jesus is teaching us here through the word of God. We ended our message last week with Jesus saying, A prophet is without honor except in his own town among his relatives and in his home. He could not do any miracles there except by his hands on a few, by laying his hands on a few people and healed them. And yet when Jesus left, he was amazed at the lack of their faith. Friends, it is faith that God will uh, usher you into the kingdom of God, friends. Faith is something of which would help to keep you anchored. On another point pertaining to this faith, friends, God wants us to have not just ordinary faith, but an extraordinary faith. A faith that is able to propel us forth. Jesus' teaching style drew the attention of massive people because he had faith he went and he prayed to God and he had faith believing that God will send the people. His style was also one that showed uh, he had authority. He was able to execute ministry in such a way, speak in such a way that caught the attention of everyone. Would it be, friends, that God would have us move in such, a, in such the same way? The comping the common people were astonished at Jesus' doctrine. He was not a scribe. He had no religious credentials. Yet he spoke like a king, with authority. The rabbis and the scribes, we said last week of the day, uh, loved traditions. They drew style, uh, uh, their style from, uh, from their fathers and from their forefathers. But Jesus, he drew his ministry style from God. But the words of Jesus were like a spring of life unto life. They were clear. They were fresh with power to quench the soul of thirst. Friends, this was Jesus' ministry. What a ministry Jesus had. And his followers would have the same type of ministry. Jesus was a teacher who was not appreciated by his immediate family. What a ministry. We're going to move on, friends, because we see here that, that God wants us to possess faith, yes, but He wants us also uh, to be able to uh, use this faith to help in the salvation of others. Because faith is trusting God. Faith is believing God and believing that He loves us and knows best what is for our good. And so we see that faith leads us to choose His way. In places of ignorance, faith accepts His wisdom. In places of weakness, faith accepts His strength. In places of our sinfulness, faith accepts His righteousness. Our lives, ourselves, are already His by faith the acknowledgement of Him by faith. We accept the ownership of Him 
in our lives and accept His blessings, His truth by faith, His righteousness by faith, His purity by faith. Heaven been pointed out as as sacred of life to success. We accept it by faith. It is faith that puts us in possession of the principles of God. Faith. Faith needs no introduction, friends. But faith is one that we need to possess. Because God invites us to grow our faith. Faith works by love that purifies the soul from all sinfulness. Thus the soul is perfected in love by faith. In heaven found grace and mercy through Christ's precious blood. How can we fail to be tender and merciful unto those of whom we come in contact with? And by grace are ye saved, the Bible says, through faith. Ephesians 5 verse 8. The mind is educated to exercise faith rather than cherish doubt. Suspicion. Jealousy. And so we see this evening, based upon what we have learned last week, friends, that we are to uh, uh, walk by faith and not by sight. Which leads us to this evening's message, uh, listening to the voice of the teacher, part two. Now, Jesus was a compassionate teacher. And what does it mean to be compassionate, friends? It means to have a sense of understanding that, 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 that someone who is less than you is in need of someone like you. I'm going to put it the way how Jesus said, because it is said Jesus did not separate his compassion from his ministry or his teaching. When Jesus uh, uh, landed or saw large crowds, the Bible says that he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. I, I want you to understand that, that Jesus looked upon any need as if, quote-unquote, he was the owner or the person able to help that need. And although he did not have the money, and although he did not have all the necessities of which men possess, by faith he was able to help people and help their needs. The Word of God helps us to understand, friends, that Jesus was a teacher's teacher. Now, what does it mean to be a teacher's teacher, friends, is that people look up to you and they appreciate you. But here it is now that teachers, when a teacher appreciates you, friends, that means something when a teacher appreciates you. One day the Bible says, Jesus was teaching. I'm reading from Luke chapter 5 and verse 17. And the Pharisees and teachers of the Lord were sitting there. Now note with me, friends. The Bible says, And they had come from every village of Galilee and from Judah and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Notice, friends, as Jesus is about ready to step forth to touch and to heal, friends, the teachers were there looking at Jesus. He was a teacher's teacher. The Pharisees and the teachers were all there, looking and observing the teacher. These men were teachers themselves. But they were teachers of the blind. They were blind teachers leading the blind. I want to put it in his right context. They were blind teachers teaching the blind. They themselves were in need of light. Now there's something, friends, when someone comes into town who knows more than you. If you're humble, you would now attend to that person's knowledge or at least seek their knowledge somehow. But in most cases, friends, because most people are proud, we say, oh, later for that person. We don't need that person around here because we want to save our jobs. We want to save our titles and we want to save our this and our that. But friends, if we truly, truly believe that what God has given unto us is something worthy, 
But because we do not presently possess it, then we're going to listen intently to those who possess that special gift. It doesn't mean that you will not have it, but at the time you do not, do not possess it. And so here it was that Jesus now had come into town and he was teaching. And the teachers were looking and observing the teacher. Take time out, friends. If you are a teacher and there is someone who knows more than you or able to help you, be humble enough to learn from that teacher. Let's move to another point this evening because we see that Jesus, uh, he was a teacher who please people first. Now, there are a lot of people out there, friends, but they are self-motivated. Motivated, nothing wrong with being self-motivated, but they are self-motivated to please themselves. Jesus, although being self-motivated, and really he was motivated through the Holy Spirit, it wasn't of self, but through the Holy Spirit. But he was motivated to help someone else. He did not do what he did to help himself. He did what he did to help others. There are many people, friends, during this time of the year, they're running for their various governments, leadership, and the like, friends, and they're actually doing it for their personal gain. Now, there are some who are, who are, who are running and or in a particular area of trust of which, of which uh, they are doing a work which they sense, and they're not doing it for their own selves. They are doing it because they sense that there is a need, and they're doing it for someone else. They're not in it for money. They're not in it for gain, personal gain. They're in it to help someone else. We're going to pick up on this story here, as Jesus here, being a teacher, as he was a teacher of pleasing others. Let's pick up the story here, and we're going to uh, pick it up here from, from the Word of God. We're looking here at Luke chapter 13. And we're going to pick it up here from Luke chapter 13, verse 10 to 17. It's a little bit of reading, seven verses, not much. But let's read it together, yes? And it says, On a Sabbath day, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit of 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmities. Notice Jesus now ministering to the needs of this woman here. Then he put his hand on her. And immediately, she straightened up and praised God immediately. I heard you all out there singing out hallelujah. At least I'm saying it for myself, hallelujah. This was a miracle. Immediately. Now, notice what takes place next. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. The synagogue leaders said to the people, There are six days for to work. Notice how now they, they, they speak about Jesus' miracle. So come and be healed on these days, not on the Sabbath day. Why will you heal, will you heal on the Sabbath day? There are six days of which you can go to King Edward Memorial Hospital or any hospital within your, the district of your, of your area. But why will you want to go to that hospital or to the hospital on the Sabbath day? Notice what Jesus says to this point now, this very important point of healing. There are six days which you can go to the pharmacy. But why will you want to go, will you want to go to the pharmacy on the Sabbath day? Notice how Jesus replies to this comment. And the Lord answered, you hypocrites. You know, friends, sometimes it's good to call people by their right name. 
Call them who they are, hypocrites. You see a lot of folk here are doing all sorts of things and saying all sorts of stuff, friends. But they don't mean it. Matter of fact, if you did something, they'll tell you what you're doing is wrong and then turn around and do it them themselves. Hypocrites. Jesus said, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath day untie your ox or your donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years. Notice now Jesus here up in their throat and he's talking to them now down in their mouth. And he's speaking to them here, eyeball to eyeball. Shall not this woman be set free on the Sabbath day from what she had been bound all these years? And when he had said this, notice what happens next. All his, oppo his opponents were humiliated. It didn't say that they were humbled. It didn't say that they said sorry. It said they felt humiliated. Now you know what happens, what happens when a person feels humiliated, friends. They're thinking of ways of how to get back to you, of pulling you down and, and straightening you out, even though you're telling the truth. But the people were enlightened by all the wonderful things he was doing. They didn't touch him that day. Sometimes, friends, it's best to call people by their right name. Now, the Word of God says that Jesus was a teacher who taught with authority and purpose. There's one thing, friends, to teach with authority. But there's another thing to teach with purpose. Everything that Jesus did, friends, it was a purpose behind everything that he did. But when he spoke, he spoke with authority. Kings and those who were in authority had to now come off their thrones and listen to Jesus. And on several occasions, Jesus was approached and questioned about his authority as a leader. A lot of people questioning, you know, friends. People question every day, why and how? Who gave you authority to do, to do such, a, such a thing? Everyone's questioning. And here it is now that Jesus, he puts the answer forth to the people and asks in them the question, tell us by what authority you are doing these things. Jesus was a teacher and he was a good teacher. He was a great teacher. We praise God for his teaching of which he was able to come forth and teach the people. And so we see here, friends, that, that Jesus, he was a teacher with purpose. But Jesus was also a teacher who taught people to build their own relationship with God as a friend. We need a friendship with our God. We need to know him even as Abraham knew him as a friend. And the Bible says that Abraham, he had understood and he had known and he had heard the voice of God. And God, he recognized him as his friend. The word of God says, I'm reading from Luke chapter 11 verse 1. And it says, on one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples to pray. Now I'm picking up here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 13. I'm going to just abbreviate it because it says, for more, we need to understand this point here, that, that for more on this thought here, friends, it says here, and Jesus elaborated stating, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, for thou art the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Notice here, friends, as Jesus was teaching the disciples the disciples' prayer. 
He said, when you talk to your father, Abba, who's in heaven, speak to him as a friend. Because God wants to know you as a friend. As Jesus now would leave his disciples, friends, they were amazed. And here is an amazing fact of all. And that is this. Ninety times Jesus was addressed directly in the gospel. Ninety times he was addressed in this context here. Matter of fact, the word father, friend. You see, these were the words of which the multitude was caught up in and they understood clearly. Thus was how the disciples referred to to him. Jesus himself used the term when he said, you are called, you call me teacher. And rightfully so, Jesus was a teacher's teacher. So 90 times Jesus was referred to as teacher. But at the same time, friends, through all of those times referred to as a teacher, friends, he wanted you to know God the Father as a friend. And what a teacher he was to point us into, unto one who was all so lovely. But God has a people who are among the blind of the earth. I want to go on to read a point, point of scripture here. It says here in Matthew chapter, chapter 15 and verse 14, Now with the best effort put forth by most people, looking for the change, looking for the change, the people became confused. And they were being uh, uh, led by blind leaders. And Jesus had to put it this way here. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. Jesus had to speak directly to the blind leaders. And today, friends, I speak directly to you, who of which... Consider yourself as a leader of God, but is not leading the people of God in the right direction. The Bible says that you are also a blind leader. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in the ditch. Leave them alone. But God has a people who are among the blind. And so he sends a message to them to awaken them out of their sleepiness and to give them light, to guide them through this treacherous way. And I'm picking up in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4, the Bible says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Notice now, God is speaking to them, to them who are in the household of the blind, being led by blind teachers. In the last work of of which God shall do on planet earth, of warning the world, two distinct calls are made to the church. Two distinct calls are made to the church. The second angel's message in Revelation chapter 14, blessed are them, friends, who listen to this message. The word of God says, Babylon is falling, is falling. That great city, because she had made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And in the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, the text I just read earlier in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven. And God has remembered her iniquity. As God calls the children of Israel out of called the children of Israel out of Egypt, that they might worship him and keep his Sabbath, as we see there in Exodus chapter 16, the word of God says here that 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 this special uh, manner that fell from heaven was collected especially on Friday, the sixth day of the week, a double portion and was held over on the Sabbath day and nothing went wrong with it. God was teaching lessons after lessons after lessons of which we ourselves of listening to, friends, 
will be further ahead today if we were obedient. The Word of God says that after the truth had been proclaimed as a witness to all nations. As it was then, friends, it shall be now. Those who listened back then were blessed, and those who did not listen, they were cursed. Every conceivable power of evil will be set in operation soon before us, friends, as we're here, here living in, in, in these last days. And the minds will be confused by many voices crying, Lo, here is Christ. Lo, He is there. This is truth, and I have a message from God. All of these things here people are saying, friends, when they are blind leaders of the blind, they don't have a message from God. And He has said a message of which to awaken the, the hearts of the people, to bring them great light. Then there was to be friends, and there will be, there will, will be, an attempt of, re, of the removing of the landmarks. And friends, they will remove the landmarks at an attempt to tear down the pillars of our faith. The faith that is found in Jesus Christ built upon the Word of God, friends. And a more decided effort will be made to exalt the false Sabbath. Friends, we're living in these days here, and I'm just trying to help you to understand, friends, that the teacher, the real teacher, the teacher of teacher, Jesus Christ, friends, has come, and he has come to awaken our hearts to the truth. We shall see, friends, it shall be an attempt made to cast contempt upon, contempt upon God himself by supplanting the day he has blessed and sanctified with another day. And this false Sabbath is to be enforced by an oppressive law. But while Satan works with his lying wonders, we're going to see something else happen. The time will, will be for, fulfilled of which God's people, friends, shall be delivered and sealed. And the mighty angel that shall enlighten the earth with his glory will proclaim the fall of Babylon. And the call upon God's people will, will be seen and they will forsake her. And when do her sins reach unto heaven anyhow? The word of God helps us to understand that when the law of God is finally made void by legislation, then... And only then, friends, will the sins of the nations reach unto heaven. And then the extremity of God's people is his opportunity to show who is the governor of heaven and earth. God's now going to step in and show you who is the true leader of the earth. And as satanic powers is steering up the elements from beneath. Soon to come, friends, God will send light and power to His people that the message of truth may be, may be pro, pro, proclaimed to all the world. There's an enlightenment that is taking place even among us, friends, which leads us to this threefold union of religion. This threefold union of religion. The Word of God says in Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 to 14, And I saw three unclean spirits like unto frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Friends, this is the battle of which God has spoken of, but we see these three unclean spirits. And by the decree enforced, the institutions, the institution of the false power, in violation of the law of God, 
the United States will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. Now, I'm going to say something here. Although we see an election taking place in, in America right now, and although we see all sorts of things being shared across the year, truth and lies, all sorts of things are, being, are, are, are coming forth. I'm not pointing fingers at no one, but I'm saying to you, truth and lies are being executed and pronounced across the airways. There will come a day when the United States will disconnect itself fully from righteousness. And when Protestantism shall stretch forth her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of, 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 of the apostate power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with, with spiritualism, when under the influence of this, these uh, 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 spiritual influences, this threefold union, spiritualism, apostate Protestantism, and Catholicism. When all these unions now gather together, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, I'm only speaking principles of truth to everyone. Then we shall understand the influence of the threefold union. And the United States shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provisions for the propagation of false worship and delusions. And then we shall all know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Friends, we are here at that very moment here in history. And so this election here that's taking place in America is more than just an election, friends. This election will determine furthering of this power, moving, trajectory, moving, uh, moving, moving quicker or being sustained just a little while longer. And if it's held a little while longer, friends, we know that there's still people who are there that needs to be rescued. What are we doing to try to rescue the perishing, care for the dying. But if God allows the powers to pursue and, and whoever comes in power who is now not moving with God, then we're going to see a quick movement of probationary time ending. And we're going to see a quick moving movement, friends, of a legislation to to legislate or enforce your worship. My worship. And so we see here this evening that 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 the ground is set. The stage is already put in place. And we're seeing the powers moving right now. Protestantism will in this act join hands with the apostate power. And it will be uh, noted and seen by all mankind. And people are going to ask the question, then, is there any room in God's kingdom for me now? Well, friends, today, while you hear his voice, heart, not your heart, this is an opportune time for us to make our calling and election sure. And so we see that this threefold union is moving ahead based upon the word of God. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4. He had two horns like a lamb. Republican, Republic and Democrat. That's the two horns. And he spake as a dragon. Though professing to be a follower of the Lamb of God. Man became in, endowed or endued with the spirit of the, the dragon. And they professed to be meek and humbled, but they spake 
and legislated with the spirit, not of God, but of Satan. These are the days that we're living in, friends, showing by their action that they are the opposite of what the profess ought to be. We're living in that day, friends. It's very hard to share this message here because it's a message of truth, but at the same time, friends, is a message that has to be proclaimed and cheered. But God wants us to awaken. Satan is trying to unite all powers as best he can in favor of his agenda. And God is trying to hold back the winds of strife until all his children are be, have been sealed for eternity. A man will not agree to trample on the foot the commandment of God. And the spirit of the dragon is revealed, but the day will come, friends, although they will agree. But the day will come, friends, they will trample on the foot the very law of God as if it doesn't exist at all. The Lord's faithful servants will receive the bitter prosecution in that day from false teachers. Even as Jesus was prosecuted in the day that he came about, friends, he was hated. He was not liked. And who will not hear the word of God and who prepares and humbles themselves before God? Friends, they'll be swept away. Notice, that, friends, by our words and by our actions, we are, de we are de determining whose side are we going to lean on. By our words and by our, our actions. But notice this here, friends. Satan cannot go beyond his limit. The Lord will be the, def the defense of his people. He, re he will regard the, the, the injuries that are done. And he'll look upon them carefully. He would understand what is happening. But he will re regard what is being done to you as being done to himself. And he will take offense against the things that are being done against you. He understands, friends, the days that we're living in here. And he understands we're living in the times of which God is trying to awaken us. Oh, friends, will we not awaken to his Holy Spirit today? Will we not listen to his voice today? Oh, friends, God is speaking to us. And he's speaking to us carefully. He wants us to understand that we're living in a time of which he's trying to awaken us. Awaken us to a place of which he wants us to have eternal life. Let us hear the voice of God speak to our hearts this evening. Let us do the will of God in these closing days, friends, walking in his will. Let us understand that corruption of truth is also taking place around the world. And thus, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not, corruption, corrupt teachers, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 23. I'm coming home on this point here as we close out this evening's message. Before the last development of the work of apostasy, there will be a confusion of faith. There will not be clear and, and definite ideals concerning the mysteries of God. These things he will be deluded from the pulpit. Not a straight message being proclaimed. And people will not fully understand what people are saying, friends. But God wants us to proclaim a straight and clear message. In these days, one truth after another will be, will, be, will be corrupt. And after the truth has been proclaimed as a witness to all nations, every conceivable power of evil will be set in operation. And the minds will be confused by many voices crying, Lo, here is Christ. Lo, he is there. Thus is the truth of God being thrown into the dirt. God has given a message, friends. He has given a message to awaken the people unto eternal life. Will you not hear the message of God? The teacher is speaking to your heart this evening. And he's saying unto you, friends, it's time for us to awaken our, our minds to the truth of the living word. 
It's time for us to take our time to read the word for ourselves. How many of us are reading the Bible? We spend more time reading newspapers and other stuff, but we don't read the Bible. We read our tablets and we read our this, but do we read the Bible? We read devotions, but do we read the Bible? We must read the Bible, friends. It is the Word of God that God speaks now through, the, through His own Word into your heart. Not saying that the devotionals are all wrong or wrong at all. But we need the Word of God, friends. There's something about reading the Bible. The Lord has given man a rule by which to, de to detect lies. It is through the Word of God, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them, friends. We need to understand what the Word of God says to us in these closing days. We need the Bible. As we near the end of time, falsehood will be mingled with truth, that only those who have the guidance of the Holy Spirit will be able to distinguish between truth and error because they have read the Bible. We need to make every effort to keep the way of the Lord. We must in no case turn from His guidance to put on uh, our trust in man, friends. The Lord's angels are appointed, as He has said, to keep us in a straight way. But friends, it is through the Word of God that God now brings back to your, you, to your remembrance the things that He has said to you at the appointed time when you need them. But we can only have them through reading the Bible. And every day we are to come to the Lord with full assurance and faith to look to Him for wisdom. Thus who are guided by the Word of the Lord will discern with certainty, certainty between falsehood and truth, between sin and righteousness, between faith and doubt, between what's good from wrong. God is calling us today, friends, to read and to study the Word of God. Listen to the teacher speak to your heart this evening. His name is Jesus, friends, and He's saying to you and to me to come back to your first love. Come back to the place of which you had first sought me through the Word of God. For Jesus is the teacher, and He speaks to our heart this evening. He is the educator. He is the principal as well, friends. But He says to us, come back to the Word of God. God encourages us to come. Will we not listen to the voice of God this evening? Is my prayer that you have heard something that have actually been able to cause you to look again and look at the Word of God for itself, friends. Take the Word of God for itself. Let God be true and every man a liar. It is my prayer that God will keep you until we meet again. May He strengthen you. May He sustain you. And may His love abide in your life, both now and forevermore. It's my prayer. Let us pray. Father, indeed we are thankful that you are the great teacher. And so we ask anew that you come into our hearts. Guide us, protect, and keep us faithful, we pray. And now unto him who is able to keep us all from falling, slipping, and stumbling, who is able to present us faultless before his throne, to the only wise God be glory, dominion, power, both now and forevermore, is my prayer for each person listening in this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, it has been a pleasure being with you this evening on You in the Word. Join me again next week for another You in the Word broadcast. We'll be looking at The Teacher, Part 2. Listen to The Teacher, Part 2. And if you've been blessed through this evening's message, write me. Let me know how you have been blessed. If anything I've said that may have caused you to think or wonder, or you may have a question on a certain point, please share that question with me that we may look further and talk with you individually on these things. May God bless you and keep your family as well. Until we meet again is my prayer in Jesus' name.